Hey folks, it's Dakota Cohen here from Cohen Farm. We're just out with our herd of grass-fed beef. In this video, I wanted to give you guys an update about the on-farm harvesting campaign that we started uh, a year ago to date. <clears throat> so for folks who aren't familiar, uh, uh, a year ago, we had a visit from uh, a government inspector uh, informing us that uh, the way that we were providing the meat to our customers was illegal and if we didn't stop we faced a ten thousand dollar fine and up to ten years in prison uh, so, sorry a ten thousand dollar fine and up to one year in prison uh, the way that we were providing our meat to our customers is uh, is through a herd share model uh, whereby basically the customers uh, were uh, purchasing a share in uh, in a herd of, of some of our grass-fed beef or some of our uh, milk-fed pork and uh, uh, they're also renting land from us and uh, in that way their animal could be harvested on their land uh, in a way that was stress-free stress-free um, uh, for the animal. The whole reason we started to do this is uh, back in 2012 we started to notice uh, you know we're our, the major focus on our farm is nutrient density of the food. You know, why else why are we uh, eating if it's not for, for nutrients that are going to uh, help us uh, achieve optimal human health? And so uh, with that focus, we started to notice that there was, uh, we started to see a decline in the, the quality of our meat uh, when we were taking it to the various butcher shops uh, in order to sell meat legally in Alberta here and in most places in the world, the meat has to be uh, uh, trucked uh, sometimes great distances to uh, what's known as an abattoir which is where the animals are are uh, are harvested and then butchered um, and but that that transportation process is something that's completely foreign to uh, to animals and uh, you know it doesn't matter how how well you treat your animals uh, and how much time you spend with them and, and how low stress they are if the last day of their or the last days of their life sometimes they uh, you have to you know load them in a trailer and drive them down the highway at 100 miles an hour that's an experience that no animal has has never gone through before uh, and it, it, it's going to uh, there's gonna be a great deal of stress on mm -hmm. that on that animal and of course you know anybody who's ever eaten uh, meat from uh, for example like wild game like a deer or something if uh, you, you know that if, if as a hunter if you get a clean shot from an animal and and the, the animals killed uh, and they drop straight to the ground the meat will be, be very good be very tender um, but if you wound that animal and it runs for you know half a kilometer and then drops from exhaustion or loss of blood that meat will be almost inedible now our domesticated animals have been bred for thousands of years to have, uh, you know, to not react to stress as well. They're not as, as hyperactive, but they still have those same, uh, you know, the, the cortisols and the adrenaline is still released whenever, the, whenever they're in that fight or flight mode, they, uh, they release those same uh, uh, hormones and chemicals that are, are basically stress inducing hormones. And if you eat that meat, you're eating those, those hormones. Now, the, there's also a lot of scientific research that's shown how the, uh, the stress on animals during harvest time uh, actually changes the color, the texture, and the nutrient quality of the meat. And so, you know, with, with this research in mind, we decided that we didn't want to, um, uh, if, if our goal as producers is to produce the most nutrient-dense food possible, and the only way we can do that legally is to uh, uh, go through these abattoir systems. You know, that wasn't something that we were interested in. Uh, now, the interesting thing in, in Alberta and, and most places in the world is that it's, it's, very, it's perfectly legal to have, as a producer, to have your animals harvested on your land uh, and, and, and eat that meat. It's just that when you take it to the butcher, just like if you harvest a wild deer, uh, you can still eat that meat even though it wasn't killed in a, in a provincially inspected uh, abattoir. Uh, and so what's, what's that all about? And so the, the, any meat that's, that's harvested that way is just labeled uninspected, not for sale. So we decided that what if we went to our customers and gave them the choice as consenting adults uh, to enter into a private contract with us whereby we would 
uh, uh, sell them a live animal, raise their animal on their land, and uh, when the time came to harvest that animal, um, we, we would take care of all, all that stuff, and um, and that way we could we could truly have the most nutrient dense food possible, uh, and also ethical meat. I mean, these you can tell these animals are obviously not, um, you know, not having a, a bad time here on the farm, and um, you know, the, there's a common saying that. You know, a lot of meat producers will have which is that you know my animals only have one bad day and that's that's the harvest day and with this previous model our animals didn't even have one bad day we were able to walk up to our animals in a pasture like this you know offer a, a, a prayer of thanks and gratitude and, and and have a bit of a ceremony and and harvest that animal with with the utmost respect and reverence uh, and with with absolutely no stress whatsoever so uh, apparently um, uh, somebody uh, told the government about what we were doing and, uh, and that's when we got a visit from uh, a fellow by the name of Paul Simard who was uh, an Alberta agriculture investigator is his official title. And uh, yeah, we, like I said, we were, we were informed that, that what we were doing was illegal despite the private contracts that we had, despite the, the fact that you know, our customers were actually producers by all rights of the law. We were told that um, it was a great idea and if it was up to him, he would actually uh, you know, prefer that, that um, other people could, uh, could sell the meat, but uh, the law is the law and he was just doing his job to protect the people. Uh, and uh, a few weeks later after the visit, we were issued uh, uh, an official document saying that if we didn't cease and desist, we would be threatened with a $10,000 fine and up to a year in prison. So we were forced to stop doing what we were doing. Uh, we've since found another butcher, uh, and, and this butcher is, is very good. He, uh, the, he has probably one of the best harvesting facilities in, uh, in the province. And um, the, once the animals are, you know, we're, we're doing our best to, to maintain the, the low uh, stress levels of the animals, but uh, it's, it's still not perfect. And, and we really want to get back to uh, the ability to, to harvest our animals on farm like we were doing before, because we feel that that truly is the only way that we can have the most nutrient dense food possible and also have the most food that we're, uh, we should feel good about eating um, in, the, in that it's ethical. And so, you know, we've got, uh, after that happened, we had a huge, you know, we, we told our community and our customers about it, and we had a, an amazing outcry of support. Uh, by the way, all that information I just shared, it's, there's, a, there's a blog that I wrote and a, and a couple of videos. I'll, I'll post a link to that in the, uh, to that original blog, so you can go in and check that out. You can actually see pictures of, of how we were harvesting these animals. This was not a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a back of a pickup truck thing. This was a, a stainless steel um, uh, mobile abattoir with, with a crane and a hot seat pressure washer. And, and then from there, the animal was taken back to a provincially inspected butcher shop uh, and harvested as per, as per code. But the, the only part that was, uh, was uh, outside of the Meat Inspection Act was the fact that the animal was harvested out on green grass or on, on fresh snow in the winter time for our pigs. So we, um, as I said, we, 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 we started this on-farm harvesting campaign to try to legalize uh, the, the ability for, for consumers to have access to this kind of nutrient-dense food that was raised ethically and harvested ethically. But, uh, uh, and, and, and that's, we had a, a huge outcry of support, uh, you know, to people from all across Canada, even into North America, have contacted us. A lot of them are producers, uh, you know, saying that they've had similar experiences. We've, I've actually had farmers contact me and tell me that, that uh, some of the, um, uh, that they themselves have actually been fined for similar things. And, they, and uh, uh, luckily for us, the, the fines were dropped uh, once we, we stopped. Uh, stopped running our, our herd share program and by the way you, you can actually read the herd share agreement that we had with our customers uh, you can you can look through that document that's all up in that blog post that I'll have in the video below so we uh, as a result of that that outcry support we had people from uh, we had lobbyists we had people from various government organizations 
that mm. wanted to help us, you know, try to, to legalize this uh, and get this passed through. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really overwhelming. But, <clears throat> uh, and, and we, were, we were going down that path. We were, uh, we were starting to have, you know, meetings and, and planning sessions around the strategy of how are we going to get this legalized and how do we change the law. And, and uh, it was about... It was about three months into that process that uh, I got a call in the middle of the night and uh, it was from another farmer and he uh, was quite frantic and he uh, informed me that his farm had just been raided by no less than five different government organizations. Uh, the RCMP, Alberta Health, Alberta Agriculture, uh, Peace Officers, and AFIC, or, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, um, Alberta, Alberta Food and Safety, or, or, sorry, uh, uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, C CFIA, uh, and his farm was, uh, uh, had just been raided by those five organizations, uh, there was SWAT teams that had came out to his farm, and, um, and he was quite, uh, uh, you know, visibly, uh, or audibly upset about the, uh, what had just happened to him. And the reason he was contacting me was because uh, we actually shared a customer in common. And when he reached out to his customers to let them know what had happened, um, they informed him that, uh, that it sounded like the, the same officer that had been involved in, in organizing his raid was the same police officer, or the uh, officer that, that came and visited us. And uh, so th this producer wasn't, wasn't selling meat, uh, he was selling raw milk. And uh, for whatever reason, in Alberta, raw milk is, uh, and, and all across Canada, the sale of raw milk is, is illegal, despite it being legal in, in, in the States. I've personally bought raw milk off the shelf in a supermarket in, uh, um, in, the, in the US. You can buy it in vending machines in Europe, but for whatever reason, it's, it's illegal here. And so this, uh, this producer had his, had his uh, whole life torn apart He's now facing uh, three $25,000 fines and jail time. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't dropped charges. And uh, uh, he, could, he could potentially have his, his, his business ruined uh, and, and go to jail. And, and the customers that he was providing, uh, for folks who don't know about raw milk, uh, raw milk is actually a, uh, basically a medicinal food and uh, and for a lot of people who have you know, anything from eczema to uh, autism, it, it, it is one of the foods that, uh, that has, is helping heal people's guts and, and uh, um, immune systems. It's, it's really an amazing food product and it's been used for thousands of years in that fashion. But uh, so it, it was at that night that I, I, um, I really put the brakes on what we were doing uh, with uh, with our on-farm harvesting campaign, because I realized that that this wasn't uh, this wasn't just about uh, uninspected meat, and it's not just about raw milk. Uh, I mean, since uh, in the past year, there's been uh, two or three laws that have have either been passed or uh, not even laws. Sometimes they're just you know backroom deals with, uh, for example, the Alberta poultry producers whereby they, they'll enact uh, uh, legislation that, uh, that forces producers who, who want to you know, produce their own chickens. Uh, and for, for egg layers, if you want to buy those chickens before you get them shipped in the mail, now you have to go through all these hoops. And they haven't made it illegal to buy chickens, but they're, uh, the, it's becoming so difficult to access the the core ingredients of of uh, you know small scale regenerative agriculture that it that very soon it will ostensibly be illegal and so all these these things kept popping up and and, and I started to to realize that uh, that this is not a regulatory problem this is a consumer education problem the fact that uh, that you know, a farmer in Alberta and farmers all around the world are being raided by government organizations that we as, as consumers are paying for, uh, and there isn't riots in the street, is not 
uh, a failure in, in the regulations, it's a failure in the public. Um, so that was the first insight that I had. Second insight I had was that, is that um, politicians are followers, they're not leaders. You know, in, in all of my conversations with, with politicians in the last, uh, last year, in, in talking about you know, what's, what's the best way to get this, uh, this uh, stuff legalized and, and how do we shift raw milk, you know, they, they always come back with the same answer, which is, well, there's just no support behind it. You know, we're just, uh, uh, or I, I, I can't be able to campaign on that. Or basically, I can't get votes. And so the, the you know, politicians are an emergent property of, or the, the, they represent the consensus of the community at large. And so uh, my, my insight is this, is that, is that we, we it's, it's not a regulatory problem. Uh, uh, it's a consumer education problem. Politicians are, are, are uh, followers, not leaders. And there's not enough farmers uh, in Alberta or basically anywhere in the world to, to be the leaders. Uh, in, here in, in Canada, in the 1930s, 30% uh, of the population were farmers. They were involved in agriculture. Today, it's less than 2%. There, and, and, and of that 2%, the majority of those farmers are heavily involved in industrial agriculture, which is destroying the planet. And so, uh, in case in point in that, uh, one of my, uh, uh, a friend of mine who had involvement with the Alberta Beef Producers Association of, of um, uh, uh, asked, in, uh, in one of their meetings, they, they tabled a, a point as to whether or not they would support the, uh, some kind of a campaign behind the legalization of on-farm harvesting of animals. And it, the majority voted that, that law down. So, you know, le uh, f uh, of that, you know, 2% of the population that are farmers today, less than a fraction of that percent are involved in, in what I would call regenerative agriculture or small scale agriculture that that that's goal is to produce nutrient-dense food not a commodity crop for extra export to the gold market and so the the the, the crux of, of this all is 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 that this is a consumer education problem and that if we want to change this law the best way to do that isn't to go and and meet the bureaucracy uh, on its doorstep and try to you know get petitions and 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 uh, go to these meetings, uh, which I have friends in, in BC who, who are who are going that approach, and the loopholes and the uh, just bureaucratic waste of time that they're going th going through is is mind-boggling. They'll they'll you know cross all the all the T's and dot all their I's, and then um, once they submit one application, they oh sorry you need to, you need to fill this out or you need to you need to go do this. And the, the, the system is designed, because again, these, these politicians are, are, are followers, they're not leaders, and they're just representing the, the, the consensus of, of the public. Uh, I, and, and I'm sure most of them are really good people, but uh, that's just the nature of the system. And so, so in reality, the onus is on us. It's, it's not about getting somebody else to change for us. We need to change for ourselves, and, and the only way you can change is through education. And so, you know, and to give it, to give some examples of this, the you know Rosa Parks, who is who is involved in in the the, de, um, the desegregation of, of of blacks and whites um, in the U.S. That that whole campaign from the time where where Rosa was was imprisoned for refusing to give up her seat to a, a, a white woman, um, and she was Rosa Parks. Interestingly enough, was actually in she was in the 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 black portion of the bus she wasn't sitting in the wrong portion of the bus she was she was in the correct spot in the bus but the white spot was all full and she had just worked a long day and the white woman asked the bus driver to, to ask this black woman to get up so that she could have her her spot in where she was supposed to be and and the un, injustice of that action uh was what spawned a movement and within two years the supreme court had overthrown the um, the, the the desegregation laws within two years, and so my 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 point with all this is is that um, this is not a regulatory problem; it's a consumer education problem. There's not enough farmers to to make the change we we that, that we need to have that 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 public upcry where uh, um, we'll have these laws shifted overnight. Um, so what we need to do is 
as as producers and consumers is to is to share uh, is to share the story and 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 get more people engaged with with this food system because uh, it's the only way we're, we're going to make this change. And, and when we do that, and when and when the when the public outcry reaches the point where um, politicians realize that oh man, there's a lot of people that care about this thing. If I want to keep my job, I better do something about that. In in a year or less, this will all go away. Case in point, look at the legalization of marijuana. You know, the, what did that happen within a few months of of, of uh, Justin Trudeau taking office? Think of all the bureaucracy and the loopholes that they had to jump through that to do that. Like, there's no way that a um, an individual could have led that organization, but because the public outcry had reached the point where it's like, hey, it, it's kind of insane that a plant that grows in the ground and has been used by traditional cultures for thousands of years. Uh, tens of thousands of years uh, if I if I have that in my pocket or if, if I'm caught using it I can go to jail for that that's that's a bit insane and enough people realize that we, sh we shouldn't be wasting um, uh, you know valuable resources in, in, in prosecuting and um, and upholding this this you know very draconian law uh, the law sh the law changed uh, take raw milk for example raw milk was was uh, illegal in in all of the US um, in the early 1900s and now it's legal in 43 of the US states and by 2020 uh, the, the advocacy groups that are involved in, in shifting those laws believe that <clears throat> uh, they'll have all the states uh, by, by 2020 that's just one more year and and the reason it's changing is because again people realize that that like, like why why is it legal illegal to um, consume something that people have consumed for thousands of years and and so if, if we want to have the ability as free citizens to choose what kinds of foods we put into our own body as, as consenting educated adults, uh, whether that's raw milk or uh, um, you know, some of the uh, her herbal, herbal medicines or uh, uninspected meat or uh, eventually the, um, uh, even even things like like organ meats and stuff like they're starting to pass laws that that uh, make it difficult for producers to to use some of these nutrient dense organ meats. So if, if we want the ability to consume these nutrient dense foods uh, without fear of prosecution from the law, the the governments and organizations that we pay for to protect us, um, we need to educate ourselves and educate other people to create a movement around this issue. And if we don't eventually it will become illegal for us to access the foods that will enable us to have the optimal human health that we're, we're looking for. Um, and, 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 it'll be, and it'll be illegal to produce these foods in a way that are actually good for the planet. You know, look at all the, the hype around the, the Beyond Burger or the, or the Impossible Meat stuff right now. Um, basically, we're taking the worst agricultural crops in the world that are, that are deforesting, or deforesting the, the globe, the rainforest, they're, they're, they're uh, producing more soil erosion than the yields of the crops um, themselves. And yet, there's no, no regulation for, uh, for that kind of insanity. And, and now you can see it in all the fast food restaurants, um, you know, bragging about the Beyond Meat Burger and, and how this is going to save the planet. Uh, uh, you know, very soon, it will be illegal, if, if we don't change this direction, I feel it, it will be illegal to raise chickens, pigs, and cows outside because uh, the, that'll be a threat to the industrial food system because uh, some you know, Chinese swine disease or the, the chicken flu will have an outbreak and they'll trace it back to a backyard flock somewhere, whether that is actually where it came from or not. And that'll be the only justification that they need and it'll be illegal for you to access pastured meats. That's where it's going, but it doesn't have to go that way. And, and all around the world, uh, uh, people have already started to shift some of these laws in, in, in parts of the U.S. Uh, on-farm harvesting of animals is legal. In, in Saskatchewan, actually, on-farm harvesting of meat is still legal. And although they're, they're trying to change that law. So we, we can turn this around, but the only way we can do that is through education. And so what I realized is, is um, and the reason I'm giving this update, is, is I've had you know, a lot of... of emails and phone calls and, and questions about you know how's the campaign coming like what, what can we do to help like can we start signing petitions like what what, what can we do and it, it's been really amazing but for the last year I've been I've been trying to think through the strategy behind this and, and talking with a lot of other producers as well 
to think what's what's the what's the the smallest amount of energy we can put into this to get the greatest effect back and and I, I really do feel that that um, the best way to affect the change that we want to see in the world is is just to um, um, is just eat the change that we want to see continue to educate our our, our ourselves and, and our customers if you're a producer about the importance of of the things like raw milk, things like on-farm harvesting, things like the ability to, to have access to small-scale processing facilities and all this other stuff. Um, if, we, if we create enough demand around that, um, the politicians will, will follow us and, and all these problems will, will turn around and we can, we can get back to doing what's actually important, um, which is healing the, plants, the, the, the planet and, and all the damage that, that we've done over the last couple hundred years with our industrial food system. Um, you know, it's just, that, that, that raw milk producer um, who's, who's now facing you know, thousands of dollars in fines, um, you know, that man left um, a high paying job in the city to start a farm because he truly felt that the, the best thing he could do um, for the service of the community was to provide them with, with this, this raw milk. And, and I know a couple other raw milk producers who uh, literally live in constant hiding because for, for fear of being caught but they, they so they, they have no they have no part in the community um, they're they basically never leave their farms and they they buy these these properties way out in the middle of nowhere uh, because interestingly enough one of the things that came out through this raw milk raid is that the the dairy board uh, in Alberta is actually uh, all the dairy farmers are part of an underground surveillance network where they basically patrol the countryside looking for anybody with a dairy cow uh, who might be you know producing raw milk and they'll inform on them uh, to you know various local uh, uh, government agencies and and they'll go and do an investigation so this particular farmer who uh, uh, who was selling raw milk was uh, the after he filed for all the information that had been um, uh, set against him for the the charges that he was facing they uh, he got stacks of paper and he found that these various government organizations had been following him and his family and his customers for over a year the, the amount of of taxpayer dollars that was spent on the witch hunt of trying to find somebody who was selling milk is absolutely ridiculous, and uh, and and meanwhile we've got you know uh, uh, the our oceans are acidifying, uh, our biodiversity is is of the, of the planet is is in the uh, the sixth mass ex die off, uh, except this time it's not being caused by by comets or asteroids or or super volcanoes. It's being caused by us, and uh, and and what are we doing? We're chasing around farmers who who want to sell uh, meat and milk. Because that's the problem. So, <clears throat> uh, I guess, in to to wrap this up, uh, I I uh, I believe that m the, my time and energy is best spent educating the public about the insanity of the food system that we that we live in right now. So, uh, uh, this is not to say that there wouldn't be benefit from somebody who wanted to engage in and things like you know, signing petitions and, and rallies and things like that. Uh, I just personally feel that that's not the best use of my, my time and I feel I'm gonna get a better return on my energy invested if I, um, if I continue down the education path. And so, so um, I, I really appreciate all your support and if there's anything, if somebody else wants to, to, to continue on the kind of the, the legal or the technical aspect of this campaign, uh, I'm, I'm all ears and if there's anything I can do to help, but I don't have the capacity to, to lead that, that movement. And, and quite frankly, um, I think from a philosophical perspective, I don't think it's actually going to affect the change we wanna see because again, it's, this is not a regu regulatory problem, it's a consumer education problem. So uh, the, the, if, if, if people want to do something about this, there's a lot of amazing organizations uh, that um, that we're actually already a part of as a farm, uh, things like the Weston A. Price Foundation, uh, which is uh, uh, that organization that was founded off the principles of, uh, of Weston A. Price. It was started in the 1990s by Sally Fallon. 
and um, and their whole goal is uh, around you know nourishing traditions in in uh, the in, in food farming and the healing arts. Uh, there's another group called the Ethical Omnivore Movement, that's led by Lana Slant from right here in Alberta, and there's um, the, the campaign that the the farmer who was uh, the raw milk farmer who was who was arrested um, and had and uh, um, and is now facing charges for the sale of raw milk. He started his, his own campaign called Farm Fresh Milk um, Alberta. I'll, I'll put links to all three of those organizations um, in the links below. They all have their all of those organizations. Their their goal is consumer education, and and I really feel like the the best way to uh, affect this change that we want to see in our food system is is through that. And so that's where I'm going to continue to focus my my attention. Um, we're, I'm doing a lot of public speaking, a lot of uh, uh, workshops around nutrient dense food, tying in this 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 uh, the story of, of on farm harvesting and the and the importance of of uh, um, uh, meat that's raised and harvested ethically and, and respectfully, and uh, and that, that's that's the way we're gonna we're gonna shift this. So uh, again, all, all those links to the the past blog and some other videos that I've done on on this topic, um, as well as the the links to the the other organizations, they can all be found uh, on our website www.cohenfarm.ca under the resources tab. Uh, or sorry, under the education and resources tab, but I'll also put those links in the show note below. Um, I, again, I for, for those people, uh, consumers and farmers who who have reached out to us to show their support, I, I can't thank you enough. But uh, I, I just I felt that it over the last year I I literally haven't stopped thinking about this. Every single day I've I've gone through trying to figure out what's what's the the best way I can affect this change and and trying different things and and after seeing the the feedback and that we were uh, after hearing this the story about other raw milk farmer and actually the final thing that that um uh that really turned me around was um i actually had a dream and uh in that dream i was uh i was walking through a, a snowy stone court courtyard like something you would see in in um you know russia or in in germany like in the in world war ii or something like that and uh, I was walking with a group of people. We were wearing, uh, you know, winter clothing, and and uh, and we were walking from one building to another building across this courtyard. And th there was a lineup of all these civil servants, things like police officers, RC people like R mounted uh, RCMPs on, on horses, and uh, lawyers, and judges, and and uh, um, you know, peace officers. There, there are all these people, and they were dressed in their uniforms, and we, and we were we were. Uh, there's a group of just civilians that I was part of. And we were walking past uh, this line of civil servants on a way to um, this other kind of ominous building in the in the foreground, and and as we were going by, I was I was quite happy and cheery, and I was I was actually shaking the hands of all these these police officers and 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 civil servants, and they were shaking my hand back, but they they weren't particularly engaging or or excited to to see me. They're just kind of you know, stone stone faced and um, eventually we got to this building and we went down to the basement with this group of other people and and, and but there's no there's no guards there's no it was it, we were just civilians and um, and we we went down to this basement and uh, and inside were uh, these um, uh, there was a long alleyway that had uh, um, these round glass doors um you know two or three high on either side of this this alleyway going down this whole thing and, and so we kind of came down these these stone steps and and looked left or right and people kind of filed up and and all of these uh these little glass doors in the wall they each had our name on it and so and it was kind of awkward and so we were as the group of people that I was with, we all kind of looked around each other nervously, and 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 I, I was looking at my door that had my name on it, and and you know the, the guy next to me had had his his uh, was beside his door with his name on it, and we were kind of looking around each other like, what are we supposed to do? And you know, nobody told us, but it was just intuitive that we were we all knew that we were supposed to open the door and get into this this um, what was behind it, 
um, even though there was nobody there, there's no, there's no, um, no directions at all. Which just that was what we were supposed to do. And uh, so the guy right next to me, you know, he opened his door, and there was a little uh, kind of uh, chamber that was just big enough for him to crawl inside. And um, and so he he crawled inside, shut the door, and as soon as he shut the door, there was uh, 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 searing flames and uh, uh, basically gases that were released in the chamber, and he started being burned alive. And in in the dream, I, I can remember his his hand slamming against the glass door, and just the screams of of him as he was as he was being as he burned alive in this in this chamber that had his name on it. And <clears throat> but the the terrifying thing was that the other people in the room just looked around at each other. We didn't do anything to help. You know, we 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 just looked around at each other nervously and realized that that that's what we were here for, and and that uh, and that we weren't going to do anything to help this man. And um, and when the screaming stopped, uh, I woke up in a cold sweat. And um, and I, I realized that because this is for a lot of the the answers to the problems that I'm trying to solve come to me in dreams like this, and I and I, I knew uh, intuitively that, that that the answer to like what am I supposed to what can I do to help affect the change in this in this food system that we're trying to sh change um, the that was a, a message that that um, I was that was communicated with me um, that that we are basically doing this to ourselves um, and that uh, that you know the, the the if if we want to to turn this thing around we um, we have to say no there's nobody forcing us into these chambers we're doing it ourselves and uh, and we can continue to blame the the governments and the the corporations and all this other all this other um, these days and, and they're doing this to us when in reality it's us and so if, if we want to stop burning ourselves alive all we have to do is say no and there's just this deep knowing when I woke up from that dream after I'd calmed down um, that that's what we needed to do and and the way that we're gonna say no is to educate ourselves about the uh, how how the system works the the and communicate that with other people uh, and have have good dialogue with the 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 civil servants who who are actually working for us to create to, to create the system that we want it's it's not going to be through protests and picketing and petitions it's going to be through um, personal responsibility uh, and the um, and the educa education of ourselves and our communities. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As I said, the, I'm going to have links to you know the organizations that that I'm part of personally. I, I have I've paid memberships in in the the Western A Price uh, organization, and I've I've made donations to the uh, Alberta uh, Farm Fresh Milk, and uh, um, the that's the way we're going to turn this thing around. So I encourage you guys to to join those organizations. And, and continue doing the work that I'm sure you're already doing in the education of, of uh, uh, you know, yourself and your communities. And if there's anything I can do to, to help that, um, just let me know. So thanks so much, and we'll talk to you later.